Well, okay then. It is episode 55 of Space Rocks Uplink. And I can't think of a much more topical idea of a show than what we're going to be doing a little later. So without further ado, we're going to bring Mark the Corkin in by the wonder of internet technology. All right, there we go. Hello, Mark. I can hear you. How are you doing? Are you receiving? I'm good. I'm good, Alex. How are you? Everybody all right? There we go. It's good. I'm not bad. Nice to see you um, from within. Uh, well, you, you got me <laughs> stumped, Mark. Every now and then you do turn up with a background where I go, <laughs> I got it. I know what you're doing. Um, this time I feel like I should know from the clocks, but it's um, it's not ringing the bell. So uh, they're going to. Yeah, let's see. Somewhere back there. Da, 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 level four. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, one of the multiple levels in the laboratory quarantine center in the film The Andromeda Strain from 1971, famously based on Michael Crichton's book. And one of those, you know, first um, kind of sci-fi movies that was not about life coming from outer space in the form of aliens with arms and legs and bug eyes and everything else. But a strain of bacteria that was brought back to Earth by astronauts and then turned people's blood to dust and, and so on and so forth. Indeed. Indeed. Well, you know, um, I, I mean, a, a phenomenal, I wouldn't say enjoyable film, but uh, <laughs> it certainly uh, it, it certainly made people think at the time, um, you know, one imagines. And uh, I guess now it's a byword for, uh, I guess, you know, a future that up until 18 months ago seemed unimaginable most people which i suppose is what makes today's show so very topical and interesting because I, I guess we're going to hear a bit about about the history of quarantine aren't we yeah we are so our guests this evening jeff mayno and uh, nikki twilly have uh written on many topics they're, they're kind of uh, the journalists slash writers uh jeff has been the editor-in-chief for gizmodo in the past nikki writes on on food and this and the technology of food uh, but this book that they've uh, just published um, called uh, Until Proven Safe, The History and Future of Quarantine. And what we're going to explore this evening is indeed about that. You know, where did quarantine, the idea of sequestering um, humans away from, with, who may be contaminated in some sense from other human beings, sequestering um, other places away from us, if, if you like. And we're going to talk about that, the idea of planetary protection. How do we keep other life forms say from us so mars if there's life there how do we prevent that being killed by our life potentially and the other way around how do we prevent ourselves being infected by uh, alien bugs but we're going to talk about the bigger picture of quarantine as you said and and how that uh, has developed over history uh, and, and as you rightly said you know something we've all become very used to uh, in the pandemic uh, since uh, early 2020 or even earlier than that in in a couple of locations Indeed, indeed. Well, uh, well, it's set to be a fascinating chat. Um, the, uh, the book is uh, uh, being released right this minute, and so we're thrilled to have them aboard to tell us a bit more about what they've been up to. So without further ado, they are going to uh, join us. Hello. Okay, I guess they're coming in right now. We'll just let that happen for them. You know, I suppose it is a live show, so it's just yep. natural that these things do occur. But, okay. uh, but one of the things that was interesting, Mark, to think about all this was really what we're talking about isn't just, and I suppose I'm going to put to them. Oh, hello. How are you doing? Oh, yeah. Hey. Hi. Hello. 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 Good to see you yeah. both. Yeah, great. Friend. Thanks for having us on. It's a thrill to have you aboard, and thank you so much for joining us. And, and Mark and I were just talking about this, um, you know, in relation to, of course, you know, the, well, I guess you could say the world of space exploration and so on. And I suppose before we get too far into this, I just wondered if I could just start with a broad question for you, Nikki. I mean, where did the concept of quarantine actually begin? Where, where, where did this notion actually start? Because because you can actually pinpoint it, can't you? You certainly can. The very first quarantine regulations in recorded history that we know of are in July 1377 in Dubrovnik. Um, at the time, it was called Ragusa, and it was part of the Republic of Venice. Um, now, people know it as a shooting location on the Game of Thrones, probably more so. <laughs> beautiful um, medieval city on the coast of Croatia, but they were the very first. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason why quarantine emerged, you know, then and at that time, it was when the Black Death first arrived in Europe after centuries free from infectious disease outbreaks. 
um, or these kind of major pandemics, the Black Death made its way to Europe and Dubrovnik was one of the first places affected because it did such, um, it was really one of the first stops for ships who were trading goods um, that had come from further east, um, spices and fabrics and so on, silks. Um, and the Dubrovnik authorities noticed that whenever these ships would arrive, they would tend to get these outbreaks that were, I mean, terrible. I think we can't even imagine how bad the Black Death was now. Um, when it first hit Europe, you would have outbreaks where one in 10 people in a city would die. Um, and so Much more than that. More, 30, 30 40, 50% of the population um, at times. And so the uh, they noticed this correlation and, and yet they didn't want to stop the ships from coming because that's how the city made a living. Um, they didn't want to cut off all the benefits of trade. And so they said, well, listen, you know, compromise solution let's stick uh these merchants and their goods um somewhere just a little offshore little island you know um somewhere close to the city but not in the city and stick them there for 30 days until proven safe until we know for sure whether they're carrying the disease or not yeah, and then that was upgraded then to 40 days from the initial 30 and that's where the the name quarantine comes from um what's interesting i think about that actually is that 40 uh, was chosen not necessarily for any medical reason. Um, you know, it's worth pointing out that they didn't have germ theory. They didn't know what was causing the Black Death. Um, so instead, they introduced this, this buffer, a period of waiting just to see what might happen. So it was a kind of early uh, example of, the, you know, the scientific method at work, trying to figure out what uh, what would happen if we, if we separated things for a certain amount of time. But 40 was chosen because it sort of made sense to people. Um, it's a biblical number. Um, it's the uh, length of a Hebrew generation. Uh, it is the you know the time that 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 Christ allegedly spent in the desert, forty days and forty nights. And so, if you were asked to spend forty days, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a state of isolation, um, it kind of made sense. You know, it was it was it felt like a cultural thing that you could uh, uh, actually undergo or engage in, and and, um, and not necessarily question it. So that's another interesting aspect of quarantine. So, so I knew that it was Dubrovnik, but I wasn't aware that it was an island just off the coast. Is because actually before, just before, well, a few months before this pandemic struck, that was where we took our last family holiday was in Croatia, and we were actually in Dubrovnik, and we went to that island or an island just off the coast. There's peacocks roaming around, and there's a lovely place to swim. Um, but I wasn't aware at all that that was the location. So that that certainly brings perspective. But what 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 was the transition? Why, if this had been happening for for years, I mean, that trade had been flowing. Um, for, I don't know for how much longer before that, but w what was the decision? Was it a political decision? Was there a, a sense of enough is enough? I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued why somebody suddenly decided, well, this is what we ought to do now. It's a really good question because mm -hmm. in fact, um, you know, there's a few different reasons why quarantine emerged where it did and when it did. One is, is as I mentioned, the that Europe actually had been relatively free from infectious diseases and the Black Death really had only just made its way um, eastward to threaten Europe. So the very first outbreaks of the Black Death are quite shortly followed afterward by the invention of quarantine. So those two things are definitely linked. But there's also something about why it was invented in these places in the Republic of Venice rather than say, uh, you know, in Constantinople or something. Yeah, and I think that comes down to a lot of reasons. I mean, certainly uh, politics was a part of it. You know, there was a, um, being a republic and part of the Republic of Venice uh, and, and then the Republic of Ragusa. Um, people actually did have a say in who led the, uh, the, 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 the populace, you know, who was in charge politically. And so there was a sense of responsibility and a sense of uh, being represented. And I think that that played a major part, actually, in um, understanding that quarantine was a communal um, you know, a uh, role that was that was taken on to protect the city. Um, this was actually became all the more so in Venice, um, you know, which uh, really kind of perfected the science of quarantine in terms of its geography and um, how easy it was to quarantine people in Venice because the city of islands, it's a city where, um, you know, people are arriving for the most part uh, by water. So it's quite easy to, to see who, who who is getting there and when. Um, but in any case, the political circumstances were such that actually that uh, uh, notaries and, and uh, uh, officials were actually required by law to ask people if they wanted to leave money to the Lazaretto network, to the quarantine stations, uh, because they were that important to the protection of the city. 
Um, so, you know, it was, it was part of a kind of civic duty uh, to uh, enforce quarantine, but also to undergo quarantine. You know, you were doing something that was both meaningful uh, and politically necessary for the protection of, of yourself, but also your neighbors. And then there's also the fact that it's a very kind of practical business-based decision. It's mm. sort of a, let's wait and see, let's figure this out. It seems to be working, let's do it. Um, it's, you know, saving us from this disease while allowing us to continue trading. Whereas in other places that maybe had a more theological view of diseases, mm. then the plague was a punishment from the heavens. And <laughs> so why would you attempt to even, you know, prevent, I mean, the, the, the way to prevent it from striking your city is prayer and repentance and, and, you know, sacrifices and depending on, you know, what religion you particularly believe in, um, as opposed to quarantine. Um, so it really, it was very specific to sort of the time, the place and the conditions, why it emerged there. And I think I think just briefly, one thing that's so interesting about that historically is that, um, you know, quarantine is based in uncertainty. Uh, you know, it's different from isolation, which require which, which when you know you're infected, um, if something is known to be a disease vector or uh, carrying a disease, you isolate it. Uh, quarantine is only if you don't know um, whether or not you are infected or if you're bearing danger. Um, and so there's uncertainty built into it. Um, there's suspicion built into it. Um, but so today, the, the the use of quarantine and we saw this during COVID-19 comes with an implication that you don't really know what you're talking about. So if a public health authority says, oh, we need to quarantine, it's evidence that they don't understand the disease, um, that they don't know how it's transmitted. And it's kind of a evidence of uh, maybe a lack of expertise. But it's interesting because 600 years ago, it had the opposite kind of air. Um, the idea that we're just going to take the time and actually separate things. Uh, and, and because we believe, or the people at the time believed that it was a secular contagion. It was something that could be transmitted person to person. It didn't come from the stars. It didn't come from you know gods or angels. Um, it was something or from the you know the inner spirit of man. Um, it was a it was a surprisingly modern and even scientific approach to trying to figure out what caused disease. Um, so it's it's interesting. I think just over over the course of several yeah. centuries, the same approach went from being modern and scientific to actually kind of feeling almost like superstitious or or a lack of knowledge. Mm. Well, this is something that really fascinates me. And um, just to dive in and, you know, very happy to be really corrected on this. But um, I wondered if and if so, how the concept of quarantine relates to the rise of, you know, scientific thought. Right. Because, of course, effectively what you're effectively trying to convince people of is that something they can't see exists. Right. Mm -hmm. And usually I would have imagined around that time, that's the domain of magic and superstition and indeed whatever the particular theology may be. So I wonder if that the concept of disease, you know, and disease spreading, you know, the trial and error, um, you know, the, the controls, all those things are necessary. I wonder if the two things are interlinked and what your thoughts might be there, because it seems to me that it, it's uh, a unique moment in time where people are being asked to, I guess, you know, uh, believe a lot, you know, um, that they couldn't necessarily verify. Yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, is true and, and is also one of the things that's so interesting. I think that your you know, quarantine asks you to believe in the invisible, but it also asks you to believe that the invisible is secular uh, and, and thus subject to scientific thinking and to scientific processes of, of separation and, and seeing what happens. And then, you know, one thing we saw again and again in our research uh, and the places that we visited for, for the book um, is that the, the, the way we design our quarantine facilities is a reflection of what we know scientifically, but also what we are, how we model risk. Uh, and so it all comes down to um, the way we understand that something uh, might be transmitted or the way that something, a catastrophe might unfold. Um, you know, we saw that actually, we went to, um, in a, the most extreme example, arguably, um, is an isolation uh, facility uh, in the New Mexican desert, uh, 2,000 feet below ground in a salt mine that's being dug to bury nuclear waste. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the, you know, the shape of the salt mine, it's called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, um, is really kind of a reflection of, uh, 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 you know, actuarial senses of danger, um, you know, what, how we imagine um, the, uh, the, the, the facility itself might be breached in the future, how we'll communicate that risk to people thousands of generations from now. Um, but so my point is simply that, you know, what we believe scientifically and what we know in terms of um, how to model risk and danger, um, takes physical form in quarantine facilities. And that's another reason why I think we were attracted to the concept for, for, for exploration in a book. But just to get back to medieval Venice, I mean, there was also a, a it, we shouldn't sort of leave you with the impression that, you know, the Venetians figured it out and this was the start of figuring out germ theory. No, it was more of a belt and braces approach. And you get that always with biosecurity today, layers upon layers and redundancy upon redundancy. And so 
even though they had observed that this buffer and this time um, seemed to, for whatever reason, reduce the, the risk of disease entering the city or spreading through the city, they also layered on, you know, religious, um, you know, there would be special church ceremonies and ringing of the bells and so on. So it was a, it, you know, and, and at the time there was also a belief that maybe, um, you know, disease was carried by miasmas or these bad smelling air. So, so the facilities were also designed with ventilation in mind. And so they just layered on everything they could. It's, it's you know, belt and braces approach, it's, you know, and, and just just an attempt, anything they could do to stop the disease from entering the city and then spreading through the city. Mm. So I'm, I'm interested by you know what Alex raised because of course other civilizations had had developed a scientific method earlier in some sense. They weren't free of spirituality and, and religion, perhaps. But is this the example where it started in Europe, or do we have any examples where maybe in China or in? Uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, for example, where earlier there may have been this recognition that something kept happening when people kept arriving, because trade was a huge thing around the world, not just in Europe, uh, you know, over thousands of years. There's an amazing, um, it's a great question and it's very hard to untangle, but there was an amazing um, uh, story that we came across um, from ancient classical history, um, uh, ancient Greece, uh, we spoke to this classicist and, and she pointed out that when um, in ancient Greece they built a, a better road system that created connectivity between cities for trade and so on, there was an increase in um, monster stories um, <laughs> and stories about people being, you know, uh, these dreadful things happening to people on, you know, as they ventured out on these journeys. And it reflected to her mind this anxiety and unease about the greater connectivity brought by the road system um, and the risks that that brought of being in proximity to others and we don't know if those others are safe or not so uh, that idea that others might pose a risk obviously goes back you know a lot throughout human history that suspicion of what's unknown is you know a, been there since humans first encountered other humans they didn't mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. um, but whether it's connected with specific specific medical practices is different yeah. and I, I just might i just might add to that actually um you know it's also interesting looking just through medical history um you know there, there are just also just different practices in western uh or in european um, agriculture even where there's more uh, domestication of animals and there's less more exposure to zoonotic uh, uh jumping of, of diseases into into human beings um, so cultures that had fewer domesticated animals had fewer zoonotic diseases and thus had fewer uh, you know didn't necessarily have the opportunity to develop the sense that diseases were something that came from say this pig or from this this other animal that we're raising for uh, agricultural purposes and so this sense that disease was something you could delay the arrival of you could cut it off and quarantine it um, i think is also something that comes from some material circumstances of a, of a, of a culture but also you know uh, just anecdotally some of the stuff we saw too you know is that if you believe that disease is a punishment from God, then fleeing your village, uh, you know, and potentially taking it somewhere else, uh, you know, is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a theological act that may be sort of a rebellion against your own religion. And so just different cultures and different societies also responded to infection in a different way. If a disease broke out, um, you know, sometimes you might inadvertently be, not, maybe not quarantining, but isolating a village because the whole idea was this is our punishment, we should accept it. And, um, you know, it, it, the, the, but it, that's not the same thing as quarantine, even if you have isolated a village and you're not leaving. So again, I mean, I, I think it is quite interesting that quarantine represents this kind of early scientific thinking. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, does not have uh, analogs really um, elsewhere, except for these kind of accidental overlaps where people, like I say, might, might not flee a village, but would isolate. It's, it's fancy, fancy. <laughs> I wonder if while you were conducting this research, I mean, were you struck by some of the parallels? Because I certainly am just having this conversation, just the same things that come up. Um, you know, of course, I'm connecting to this chat from London. I mean, a city that's, you know, obviously no stranger to plague. Um, uh, but, you know, what, what's so interesting, I think, about, you know, these histories, you know, um, is that many of the factors and considerations, um, or at least to me, seem to be the same, you know, um, just immediately the question of trade comes in, you know, just like there's the argument, what can we do safely in the face of this thing that we can't completely control and so on? Were you struck by some of the parallels? I mean, 
Do you think that perhaps there's something that we could learn from those histories to maybe apply to our own situation? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, again and again, and it was kind of um, both fascinating and frustrating as COVID-19 unfolded and, and people were having the same debates and uh, making the same mistakes to that, that we had seen again and again in the historical record. And that's even that's part of the hope of uh, writing this book is that, um, you know, we are uh, likely entering a new era of pandemics, um, just with increased um, novel disease emergence um, as we go into sort of the world's last wild places and we farm animals in ever closer conditions and um, just allow those, oppor those diseases opportunity to emerge and then we travel so much more quickly um, and uh, globally than we ever have before. And so this is not going to be the first global pandemic of, uh, uh, I mean, the only global pandemic of our lifetime, sadly. And so it feels really important to, to actually take on board some of those lessons, which, as you say, there's always this debate about, um, are these restrictions worth it? Um, you know, the, the trade, the restriction, the economic impact of them, always um, a, a debate. There's always a debate um, about, well, if they're not um, watertight, what's the point? Um, so quarantine has always been leaky, and yet it still works to reduce transmission. But that's a difficult concept to communicate. You know, people want a thing to be complete, tight, a rule, and quarantine is messy thing that we if we if enough of us do it it works but it seems unfair it's leaky it's it's it's, it's not right it doesn't work for people so again you know and even just to the level of what's the quarantine experience like people have been writing about being bored in quarantine since the dawn of quarantine mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you know everyone was going completely bananas and watching netflix for half their waking hours um last year well We've been there before too. Yeah. And even even resistance to quarantine is something that you know we saw again and again. Um, you know, there wasn't like a golden age of quarantine where everybody went along with the rules. Uh, you know, from the very beginning, they had armed guards stationed outside of lazarettos or quarantine stations. Um, you know, they would have uh, put patrol ships circling some of the islands in the Adriatic to make sure people weren't trying to swim to shore. Um, you, know, you see resistance, you know, uh, you know, to quarantine is coextensive really with quarantine. And from the very beginning, there was also uh, a tradition of authorities um, imposing quarantine and yet being resistant to um, accepting its limitations um, themselves. So uh, yeah. Dominic Cummings of, you know, Dubrovnik <laughs> existed. <laughs> so, so I'm intrigued if we jump back in sort of history again a little bit and then make the link to the, the other topic we're going to talk about this evening. If we go forward 100 years from Dubrovnik, then we start seeing Europeans going across the Atlantic uh, and, of course, killing many of the people that lived in the Americas through transmission of diseases which they had not been exposed to before. Was anybody aware of this? Had anybody learned the lessons? Because this is now forward contamination. This is not now saying, you know, didn't expect those Europeans necessarily to quarantine themselves. What, what did that mean? But were they aware that they might be taking something with them which would be bad for the people where they were going? Obviously, in Dubrovnik, people were aware that something was coming in from the east, but clearly that lesson hadn't been learned even a century later. Well, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, to mm. think that, I mean, people from the east might be suspicious if you're Europeans, but thinking of yourself as suspicious is a very uh, different mental process. And you see mm. that again and again with quarantine. Europeans who actually ended up having to spend time in quarantine in much later in the 1800s wrote about how weird it felt, honestly, for them to be the potentially dangerous, diseased, dirty ones. Um, Europeans obviously were very used to thinking of themselves as the civilized, the you know the ones who are bringing um, the gift of civilization to others, um, and not as the carriers of infection and disease and something negative. So yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think people made that mental leap at yeah. all. I mean, I wonder, yeah. in fact, to go just to fill in on that, I mean, it's possible, and it has been mooted, that it was used as a tool as well, after all. People recognised, once they recognised it was happening, actually people didn't care. It's like, if you die, you're not us, we can survive this. So it's a way of winning a war without having to use weapons, I suppose. And and I think there are parallels, you know, you've seen that kind of creeping out. We're better than them, that, you know, they lock up, but we would never stand for that in our society. So let them do it, we won't do it. 
Yeah, and I think, I mean, you did actually sometimes see it weaponized in the sense of, you know, smallpox blankets where, you know, uh, and deliberately infected materials were given to the indigenous population in North America because it, the, it was a, a connection was seen between, uh, you know, uh, a, a certain objects, uh, certain kinds of material and the spreading of, this, that, of these particular diseases like smallpox. But it's also interesting because so much of that stuff, um, you know, the, the mortality happened for Europeans, you know, off, uh, you know, out of sight. Uh, you know, they brought the disease, it, it uh, affected the indigenous population who then brought it back into uh, where they were living. And that was before the Europeans got there. Mm -hmm. And so by the time the Europeans showed up, it felt as if they were on an uninhabited continent because they just literally just did not see the, the number of uh, people who used to live there until quite recently. So it's it's interesting that, you know, just even just imagining the um, putting two to do two and two together and realizing that, yeah, they're the dangerous ones. They brought this thing to North America. Um, but that lesson, you know, and we talk about it in the book, actually, is one of the things that inspired some of the thinking when it came to um, interplanetary exploration. Um, the, the idea was, let's avoid doing this again. Um, you know, let's not make the same mistakes. Let's not bring my dangerous microbes to the moon or to Mars. And let's on... not be Columbus was literally, yeah. you yeah. know, an expression. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm paraphrasing a quote from Joshua Lederberg, who was one of the, you know, the, the people to sort of initially raise this question of how do we protect um, the rest of the universe from us so in that regard you know the, 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 that's a fascinating you know entree because it, it was you know embedded in the 1960s and this whole idea of it was two-way contamination as well when the apollo astronauts came back from the moon the, the first astronauts were put in a quarantine a kind of an airstream con uh, uh, container on the uss I wonder, was it the hornet i think maybe in, in for uh, apollo 11 um and that didn't last very long right i don't think that was true by the end of the apollo missions i don't think they had quarantine but going forward forward contaminating was something we've held on to and yet it has changed hasn't it subtly over the years so in your research looking into this i'm wondering whether you've seen a shift in the space community towards saying well yeah that was then but if we if we expect to do anything today we've you know we've got to have we've got to take the risk right i mean i've been colleagues are always looking at the planetary protection rules. I wonder if you can sort of draw a line between those early sort of absolutely nothing and today, well, how do we explore if we can't at least risk contamination? Yeah. Even the yeah. early debates were not um, as sort of, uh, you know, all or nothing as you might think. Um, you know, there were some people who said, well, we need to protect these other planets that we might go to um, just to help us understand them scientifically. We don't want to contaminate our own scientific research, basically. Mm -hmm. And then there were other scientists um, uh, who and, and, and philosophers, thinkers, who said, no, um, it's a moral duty. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if there is life on Mars, then um, it belongs, you know, Mars belongs to the Martians, and we must not do anything to threaten that. Um, that that's, you know, morally wrong. So even at the start, there was a lot of debate, and of course, it was tied up in all this Cold War, um, you know, space race at the time. So while you have people debating the ethics, you have other people, you know, thinking that the Soviets are going to get there first, and you know, we must do everything. You know, we don't have time for these kinds of scruples. So it's always been um, a hotly debated topic, and I think something that some scientists just see as a ridiculous burden. Um, holding us back from scientific pro, uh, progress and perhaps even unnecessary. Um, if, if you know, in, you know, in a sort of lithopanthermia sort of scenario, life is already sort of spread around the universe on meteorites and so on. Why are we even doing this? Is a complete waste of time versus people who think we don't do enough, you know? Yeah, yeah and I think a lot of Go on, Jeff. Well, just simply, I also just think the uh, the notion of acceptable risk and how it was calculated has also just changed over time. And so just literally the way in which it's calculated whether or not there's going to be a risk of contamination um, is something that is that has that has been changed over over the course of planetary protection. Um, and I think that too, you know, the 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 actual quarantine measures that were that for back contamination, you know, bringing samples back to Earth, including astronauts, um, was actually um, sort of manifestly a failure in the sense that. Um, you know, we, we talk about this in the book, how, um, you know, even when the, the capsule splashed down in the Pacific, uh, you know, they, they, the rags that they use to wipe off the dust and to get rid of the lunar regolith that, that might contain extraterrestrial life, 
um, which is, they were just dropped in the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, they 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 vacuumed out the interior to try to get rid of any kind of you know uh, traces of lunar uh, uh, materials. Um, but then emerged on the ship, just covered in gray dust that then just you know blew away in the wind. Um, but so you know there there were just many 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 examples of how the actual quarantine procedures that were built into, a, in particular, the early Apollo mission. Um, were really kind of tacked on and weren't thought of in advance. And I think just briefly, that's one of the other things that's changing now is that we're thinking more about forward contamination and in the case of Mars sample return, back contamination um, as part of the mission design so that we're designing for it in advance and getting ready for this to, to, to bring samples back and not just pack on some random things when it gets back to Earth and figure out a way to protect us. Yeah. If, if I could just, um, uh, just pause there just for a moment. Um, I'm just wondering if we should uh, explain what the concept of forward contamination is for people, just in case they're wondering um, what that means exactly. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, it's always good to, yeah, to get the term straight. Um, yeah, so forward contamination effectively just means bringing uh, the contamination with us. So, you know, if we send a, either a rover or some kind of robotic craft into space or onto another planet or moon, um, that on that craft or on that rover will be uh, biological material um, that can potentially replicate in that new environment. Um, so that is the idea. Of we've brought something with us. Uh, we've brought it forward, and that's forward contamination, um, very roughly speaking. And then back contamination is the idea that we've actually we bring it back with us. So um, a sample has come to Earth, a spacecraft has has has, has crashed or uh, come back. Um, astronauts themselves have been elsewhere and returned, um, but then uh, amongst them, you know, on those lunar rocks, um, inside those samples of of, of uh, you know a lunar regolith or of comets. Um, or you know, in the uh, the suits that the astronauts themselves wore, um, is something that they've inadvertently brought back with them, and that that's back contamination. And so quarantine exists to protect both in both directions. It's a, it's a kind of a bi-directional quarantine, um, and planetary protection is part of that. The slogan mm -hmm. is all the planets, all the time. Um, <laughs> the official slogan. So the Earth needs to be protected as much as the other planets do too. Yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to jump back to the point you made, Nikki. Also, this sort of the, the distinction between protecting our scientific work against contamination that we may have taken with us and then the ethical dilemma of uh, should we take over planets that might have other life forms which are separate from us there is of course this third issue which is becoming increasingly um, well I wouldn't say it's a majority view by any means but I'm seeing it more and more as this idea it's actually a moral duty for us to literally send our, our biosphere or our biome out into space and seed other planets in our solar system but beyond as well even exoplanets you know let's seed them because in a million years time or five million years we might get there and it should be prepared for us and i wonder if you're actually you know if you're there's a philosophical angle to that as well it's about the ascendance you know that humans and life on this planet is worth more than life elsewhere um, mm. Is that a discussion which you had with people where people said, well, that's actually not so important because we're the most important life form there is? It's, yeah, it's, it is really interesting. It's mm. sort of an echo of Columbus in uh, and that European superiority in, uh, in today's mindset. I think you do see it particularly, and this is an emerging challenge in planetary protection, um, in the private uh, space sphere. Mm. Uh, a lot of these um, tech billionaires have an enhanced sense of their own importance, um, <laughs> put it mildly, um, and someone like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, um, you know, is perhaps uh, more convinced of the, you know, the value of, of them and, and people like them colonizing space and less concerned about, you know, other th the fact that perhaps there might be other forms of life out there um, that we could be threatening uh, by doing that. And so, yes, it is something that's coming up and that what's so interesting about it is that um, in most countries uh, that have a planetary protection, um, you know, uh, kind of department built into their space agency, um, there isn't regulatory power. NASA is not a regulatory agency. And yet under US law, um, the US is responsible for making sure that, um, you know, spacecraft that take off uh, with, you know, from its soil are not forward contaminating the universe. But who enforces that is still totally up for grabs. And actually when we um, spoke to the new um, planetary protection officer at NASA, I suppose she's not that new anymore, Lisa Pratt, that was one of her most pressing concerns was how to, um, this is, you know, 
planetary protection protocols have been built into how the um, state space agencies, ESA, JAXA, NASA, do their work. Um, and they, people might grumble, scientists might grumble, they do grumble, uh, mm. but, <laughs> um, but they're just built into the workflow and there's an approval process and it, 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 you, you're not gonna get your rocket launched if you haven't followed the, the uh, protocols. But that doesn't apply and, and the rules are changing very fast for how, who, gets, who gets to send a rocket into space. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's, it's definitely an emerging issue right now. I mean, yeah. It is. Yeah, we saw it, we, we saw it with um, the Berashit spacecraft, which was sent to the moon, um, where it was admitted after the fact that some dried tardigrades had actually been encapsulated and put on. And when it crashed onto the moon, of course, it, you know, in a, a sort of philosophical sense, it crashed. They could spread out. Now, probably they didn't, but you know that that was not actually um, regulated it wasn't even declared in advance and I I think again you're exactly right there's this sort of microcosm of the roles of, of the billionaires to say well look who are you to stop me doing what I want to do you don't have regulatory rights and in fact if you do I'm just going to go and launch my rockets off an oil rig somewhere outside of your or yeah. I'm going to buy a country you know we've had discussions <laughs> about well people have said right let's go and launch um, uh, our rockets from Indonesia. Let's buy an island from from Indonesia and do it there. And I think that this is wrapped up in in the whole discussion we had last week as well about where society will say it's our right to say you should not do this philosophically. It's a bit you know it's a bit worse than climate change, or it's a bit more remote than climate change to say you shouldn't pollute an exoplanet with uh, our life because we we don't even know if there's life there, but. It raises enormous questions about how we do regulate space, and I'm wondering if, if if you've been involved in in your research in looking to how those rules are being discussed and updated, or is it, are we just literally well, whatever happens, happens? It's a good question. I mean, it is under you know review right now. I know there's a you know advisory boards preparing the reports, bringing in input from all over. I, I would say if if history has anything to show us here, it's always that there will be a pragmatic solution rather than a sort of necessarily particularly ethical one. Mm. That's how planetary protection has worked from the start. It's what we can agree on. It's what we can achieve. It's what we can enforce. Um, and that's not necessarily the the you know the position that one might hope, but it, it, that will sort of, that's where you end up arriving mm -hmm. um, just kind of by default. Yeah, and I think actually some of that can be reflected, um, you know, just in, in practical terms. Um, you know, I think there's a development of a sense of protected areas. And so we're seeing that with uh, the, the moon, for example, where certain parts of the moon are considered inviolable and, and should not be uh, contaminated. Um, you know, cold traps or, or, or you know, where um, there might actually be lunar organisms present um, living in a totally different ecosystem than what's present on Earth. Um, and so maybe we can just reserve those, you know, and then actually then the rest of the moon can be open to helium-3 mining or, or, you know, or exploration by Chinese robots or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that, that that is also being applied to thinking about where on Mars uh, would be the places where we're tr deliberately trying to avoid um, you know, almost like, uh, you know, all these worlds are yours except Europa. Um, you know, it'll be like, all you know, all, this whole planet is yours except for this polar region or except for this crater field. Um, and I think that people are just realizing that we just simply can't have total planetary protection. Um, there has to be some compromise because eventually, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos Jr. is going to show up on Mars or, you know, uh, the, the Chinese government is going to send rovers or whoever it might be um, that don't necessarily correspond to the, the sort of total vision of planetary protection. And so that, that's, that's one of the compromises that I think is being hammered out right now. And I think people thought we would have more information by now to make yeah. these decisions. That's the other thing that's worth bearing in mind. when. Planetary protection protocols were first discussed for forward contamination. There was a time limit on it. There was mm -hmm. a 20 year time limit, actually. That was the, the period of biological interest. And mm -hmm. after that, it was assumed that we would know everything we needed to know about indigenous life on, you know, elsewhere in the universe, because we'd have done so many missions and found out so much science that we'd be able to make a much more informed decision. Um, and, and the problem is that our SpaceX exploration has been slower in some ways than people wanted it to be you know and, and we have also as we have learned more learned more about what we don't know um and so actually this process of trying to reduce uncertainty has actually created many much more <laughs> uncertainty yeah. um and so that's that's been an issue too and i think you know as jeff mentions these sort of sites of special scientific interest approach um you know uh, 
is a way to try and kind of hack at that problem and say, well, we can't answer this question for all of Mars, but can we say at least, well, we're not, we don't care about these parts. We, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, not only have we learned, have we maybe been a bit slower in our progress, but we've learned here on Earth that life can survive in much more extreme environments than we thought maybe 50 years ago. Um, and that doesn't necessarily translate to life developing under those circumstances on other planets, but it could mean that our life could survive in places where we think, well, actually, after this amount of time, we can forget that contamination because it'll just be killed by the UV radiation or so, right? But we now we know that there are very radiation resistant um, microbes on the planet Earth that maybe if they got carried there, maybe yeah. they would be able to survive. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually uh, fascinating. One, one thing that um, it would be too large of a detour to really get into in this conversation, but is, is subsurface life on Earth and its discovery by um, uh, it was deep spelunking teams and even miners who were finding uh, organisms living under extreme pressure away from all sunlight altogether, um, you know, powered by radiation and the rocks and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, one of the uh, people that we visit in the book is um, Penelope Boston, um, who was a speleobiologist who was consulting and working on some early planetary protection uh, protocols. And, uh, you know, speaking with her about uh, the discovery of uh, exotic organisms in Lechuguilla Cave in New Mexico. Um, Lisa Pratt, the current planetary protection officer, uh, is actually has a background in um, uh, subterranean setting subterranean life, including uh, the organisms I mentioned in a in a South African mine. Um, but so the idea that it's actually the subsurface of planets where light that might be conducive to life and its and its uh, preservation or, or perseverance, I think is is totally fascinating, um, and is one of the things that actually is is, is you know is it will will play out in an interesting way in the future. Um, but also, you know, you mentioned the idea of these. Um, it, very particular environments on Earth uh, that, uh, you know, may we may inadvertently send life uh, elsewhere from those. Um, the place that I think is with extreme irony uh, is actually the spacecraft assembly facility itself. Um, as I'm sure you no doubt know, um, the sterilization procedures used in the name of planetary protection and in the name of mitigating forward contamination um, are ironically selecting for the hardiest organisms and so we're, we're, we're inadvertently helping to bring into existence, or, or at the very least, we're selecting for um, these microbes that can, in fact, survive extreme aridity, uh, you know, high uh, doses of UV radiation, um, and, uh, extreme pressure. You know, the things that we would do to sterilize our instruments and rovers um, and it means, ironically, now that they actually have, quote unquote, spacecraft assembly facility organisms, uh, 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 you know, associated with them. And we are sending those to other planets. Um, so I do actually think that it's one of these, uh, you know, it's an almost novelistic irony that the, the 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 procedures we've implemented to protect other planets might actually be seeding them with the hardiest terrestrial organisms we have. And we have <laughs> sent those to Mars. I mean, yeah, as, as John Grunswald mm -hmm. the, at NASA has said, we, we know there's life on Mars. We sent it there. Yeah. Uh, and and it is often these organisms that are actually potentially capable of persisting and um, whether they're capable of reproducing and, and so on is a, is a whole different question. Yeah. But So in terms of like, I, I suppose you could say both a sociology of germ theory, um, but also just like, a, I guess, just uh, from a historical perspective, I mean, Mark's got a background related to the Andromeda strain. I mean, a phenomenal film. You know, it'll never happen, right? Um, going, going deeper into the worlds of sci-fi, for instance, I mean, H.G. Wells, I think, made a pretty powerful statement about what um, contamination could mean for a species, you know, with the War of the Worlds and so on. And so for the longest time, things have been the preoccupation of literature and as we all know, just over 100 years ago, influenza, you know, just had catastrophic consequences um, for the population, you know, throughout Europe and so on. However, despite all that, we seem to forget over and over and over again. And I just wondered um, if in the course of your research, our ability to, to almost collectively develop this amnesia about disease and so on, because you would have thought by now, we were kind of experts in the subject, you know, but, you know, again, um, Andromeda strain forward, you know, it's again, this, this sort of this, this idea, it'll never happen, you know, and we know it has. I mean, why, why do you think that is? Uh, well, to, to address the, the kind of middle part of the question, I think that what's so interesting and one of the reasons why we forget and why there is a collective amnesia about pandemics and about uh, widespread disease outbreak uh, and even quarantine itself. Um, one of the reasons why quarantine seemed obsolete uh, and then and took people by surprise during COVID-19 um, is that, you know, we're very good at erasing traces of previous pandemics. 
um, you know, once the plague is gone and you don't need that lazaretto or you don't need that quarantine facility, um, why keep it around at all? Why not demolish it? Uh, why not turn it into something else entirely? Now it's a, you know, a tax administration office or it's an art gallery. Um, the other thing is that often, uh, often a lot of lazarettos and quarantine facilities um, were temporary. Um, you know, they were built out of wood. Um, they were built on a remote beach somewhere or on a distant island. And when the disease they were uh, built to contain is now no longer a threat, the facility was burned down, uh, you know, as a kind of last gasp uh, disinfection protocol. And so there are not a lot of uh, like fossils left behind for us to study quarantine or to understand diseases uh, of the past. And then on top of that, I feel like people just want to forget. I mean, I think we're going to see this and already are seeing this with COVID-19. You know, as we emerge, people are ready to just go and just do pretty much anything else but think about COVID-19. And, uh, you know, we, we tend to erase uh, the memory of these things and not talk about them and move on. And, uh, and, and that, that's, I think, one of the reasons. There are many reasons, but that's one of the reasons that uh, means that we don't really have a collective memory for these kinds of disease outbreaks. I also think there's something um, really fascinatingly sort of unheroic about how quarantine and these kind of protective protocols are perceived. Now, to me, they are heroic. You're going to these enormous lengths. You're making personal sacrifices or or in the case of planetary protection, you're adding expense and engineering ingenuity and, and you know, even mission delays to make sure um, you do no harm. And that's a that, you know, when we celebrate that with doctors and the Hippocratic Oath. But um, but it's not a narrative that is seen as heroic in in our culture, um, making that sacrifice for the greater good. It's seen as passive and um, and sort of uh, almost a cautious hedging of kind of bets, doing the best we can. It's very, it's very, um, you know, almost sort of nervous, anxious that the, the biosecurity belt and braces approach comes across as like being nervous Nellies, doesn't it? And expecting the worst. And, and so that's not the kind of bold heroism that we typically celebrate in our culture and our stories. And so I think it does, it does get forgotten. And, and just and briefly too, I, I would just say that the second, the latter part of your question about the Andromeda strain and, and whether or not it really will happen, um, you know, as the as the, the science fiction uh, fan between the two of us here, um, I'd say uh, the other genre that's quite useful here is horror. Um, you know, there are outbreak narratives that throughout science fiction and horror that really show something about the the. I think the human imagination gravitates towards small moments that have enormous consequences. Um, so you know, there is a, a lab leak in the stand, the Stephen King novel, that then decimates the world. Um, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're in, the, in the Andromeda strain, a seemingly, you know, a, a exotic microbe uh, or viral, uh, a, a, you know, crystal form comes to Earth and, and next thing you know is, is expanding out of control. Um, but I think those kinds of narratives are, are attractive on a, on, a, on, a, on a kind of mythic level. I think uh, it's, they're, they're exciting to think about. Uh, they, they give us the sense that, um, you know, uh, great things come from small beginnings, even great, terrible things. Um, but, you know, I think that and I want to make sure it's clear that I'm not saying that this is the likely uh, thing or that it's going to happen. But I think that you see the same kind of imaginative appeal of um, some of these viruses that are being discovered, um, you know, waking up in the permafrost that's melting in Russia um, or melting in the Himalayas. You know, we're finding gigantic viruses or we're finding, um, you know, uh, corpses killed by smallpox, uh, you know, uh, deer or caribou or whatever it might be. Um, but I just think there's some, there's something just imaginative about thinking that way. And so. Um, you know, whether or not there will be a, a, an Andromeda strain, um, you know, I don't think I can firmly say yes or no, but I do think there's people will be talking about that kind of thing, I think, for, for, for generations to come. Yeah. It, it's interesting because for quite a while now, I've been sort of extending from the way that the, the world has responded to uh, SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID-19 and saying, well, look, if we can't manage this, we're obviously not going to be able to manage climate change um, because, you know, there's so many vested interests in saying, well, why should I work for them? And, you know, my island's not flooding and it takes place on a long enough time scale. So to be provocative, I wonder if, in fact, our response has been muddled precisely because it hasn't been catastrophic enough, that it has just been sort of drip, 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 and it's been slow enough. I mean, and of course, you, in Hollywood, it has to be all, all over within two hours, more or less, right? I mean, that's why asteroid strikes are much more exciting than climate change films, unless you fake the climate change and it's a massive tsunami which kills everybody in New York. Um, so has has COVID-19 actually not been fast enough? I mean, e Ebola, for example, is, has been seen, at least from the West, as vastly more terrifying. And we've sort of put in the idea, everybody should be quarantined. We shouldn't let anybody in from that country at all um, because we see it much worse. So is it kind of a Goldilocks pandemic that we haven't learned the necessary because it's, it's happened over two years rather than over two days? Yeah. 
it's really a that that's an interesting idea mm. it's just not terrifying enough um mm. uh and uh, you're you're probably right um although uh climate change at this point should be terrifying yeah, enough yeah. and sure. still not doing anything <laughs> sure. well i mean it's, I, th I think it's a very good point though that you raised i mean you know there were even editorial cartoons that you know, showed someone, you know, basically saying like, everybody panic, only 99.9% .9 of us are going to survive COVID. Um, you know, the idea, it just isn't fatal enough. It's not fast enough. You know, it, it isn't necessarily uh, something that struck the the appropriate fear triggers in culture, especially Western culture, where it was actually something to worry about. And um, I do think that that is a problem. You know, it, it was, it, it remains to be, or it's still dismissed politically, psychologically, um, as something that we are even need to, to fear. Um, you know, I'm certainly not saying, you know, uh, that I, I, I hope there is a more terrifying pandemic to come. Uh, that That is, is potentially likely the case. Um, yeah. But I do think that, yeah, sometimes we need extreme events or experiences to actually spur us to action. I mean, having said that, you know, we just had a, you know, catastrophic flooding in Western, Western Europe. Um, you know, we've had unbelievably huge wildfires here on the West Coast of North America where you, know, you couldn't even go outside because the smoke was so bad. But is that changing anything? Uh, you know, it's a uh, there's there's a lot of reasons. Every, everyone has a counter explanation. You know, it's sunspots that are causing climate change. You know, every, every, <laughs> it, it was it was bark beetles that killed all the trees, and then that's why they burned. You know, there's always, everyone's always, there's always a counter explanation. I think I think actually the crisis is just sort of there's no shared reality anymore, and that there's too much misinformation, and there's no there's no trusting about expertise. Yeah, and I even wonder whether or not that these are causally linked at some level, right? That, that as things seem to be getting slowly worse in, in, in the world, and some people say, no, they're not, everything's getting better. Well, you know, climate change is certainly the biggest challenge that we face and it is getting worse. We're also seeing kind of another virus, the, 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 the memes that people are developing, their resistance to dealing with it is getting stronger as well in half of society or a third of whatever fraction it is. So in a way, by having something like COVID-19 not being dangerous enough, it actually has led to ideas and groups forming around resistance to doing anything about it, which may be fatal when another one comes along. I mean, I hope not. Maybe that's too dystopian. No, but it has con contributed to, I think, the decay of trust in scientific expertise, certainly, mm -hmm. which is a huge problem. And, and, you know, public health can't work without that kind of trust in scientific expertise, but nor can combating climate change. You know, if you if if that trust bank is not um filled then no one and no one is listening to experts then yeah we're we are all screwed i think there's a the you know in the book we talk about this a little there it these questions especially with quarantine they require us to think calculate risk and we're just notoriously bad at that mm. people will um i don't know uh you know happily um go and drive for example, on the freeway where you're much more likely to die um, than, uh, you know, and then they're afraid of flying where you're much less likely to die. And mm. so there's just a, there's a huge um, sort of, it just seems that our brains are perhaps not actually very good at, at calculating and managing and coming up with realistic assessments of, of risk and, and uh, likelihood of, of those risks. And, and that's part of our problem as a species too. Mm. Well, you know, it, it's interesting, though, isn't it? You know, because, of course, in all of these areas that we've covered, you know, everything from interplanetary exploration to, you know, um, medieval, uh, you know, plague mitigation and so on, it's always come down to belief. It's that very concept of seeing something bigger than yourself, you know, um, thinking as a species, not as an individual. That's what it's really all come down to, hasn't it? I, I guess Mark touches on a really important point there, because look, whatever happens, uh, it seems that, you know, um, we're going to be picking what's just happened apart for, for some time to come, I'm sure. And I, and I wonder if it's going to be posited whether um, whether the COVID-19 was more dangerous than the information and the misinformation around it all, right? Because, of course, I guess something that, you know, we will have never really seen before is just this network of information sharing around it all where, you know, um, as Mark says, you know, there's there's always a point and an immediate counterpoint to, to almost anything that is out there. And I, and I wonder if if that's, you know, a different kind of viral um, consideration that, you know, has really played into all of this. Well, that's something that I think uh, 
you know, has happened around COVID-19 and perhaps we, uh, but we have, we've seen it emerging before COVID-19. I mean, I think you think that the election of Trump wouldn't be possible without um, that kind of misinformation um, spreading. And um, I, similarly Brexit, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's um, so the rise of that kind of uh, alternate reality in, in being disseminated um, in, in news media and online is something that sort of precedes COVID-19, I think, but did amplify COVID-19. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, we in the book, we, we give a couple examples, actually, of just the lack of belief that something might be a real threat. Um, you know, we, we even going all the way back to Dubrovnik and Venice during the Black Death, um, you know, we, we point out how, um, and, and this is a, another one of my interests, I, I previously wrote a book called A Burglar's Guide to the City. Um, and uh, it actually turned out that some people just didn't believe that, you know, that this was necessarily a threat. And so they, they formed burglary crews that would break into quarantine houses while the people were out at the Lazaretto and steal things, uh, eventually actually targeting Lazarettos themselves, breaking in and stealing the goods. After all, this is where all the wealthy, or excuse me, all the um, uh, expensive merchandise and new, new shiny things are coming into the city. And so why not rob the Lazaretto? Um, you know, many times that led to outbreaks that led to contaminated goods being traded on the black market in the city. But so my point is that communication of risk and the belief that what you're describing is a real thing is is a is a is is a is a huge Achilles heel in the in the quarantine discussion. Um, you know, we even saw see that with uh, nuclear waste. Um, you know, we we again, it's not quarantine; it's isolation. Um, but we look at plans for how to communicate to people thousands of years from now that radio ra radioactive waste, nuclear waste, is in fact dangerous. Don't dig it up. Um, you know, you don't want to touch this stuff, um, you know, but the, the idea of, of communicating that in, you know, what language you choose, how you actually describe it, um, surely marking it at all will actually just attract people to come see what it is. You know, why did you go through the effort of burying all this stuff? It must be sacred. It must be uh, expensive or, or special. You know, after all, we went into the pyramids and took everything out. Um, so in any case, my point is that, you know, yeah, you see these problems throughout history in terms of, um, actually convincing someone that this is a real threat. Even the head of the CDC's uh, Global Migration and Quarantine, um, who we interviewed over the course of several years uh, from before quarantine, or excuse me, before COVID to during COVID, um, pointed out that despite his historical mastery of previous outbreaks, you know, that he's been working on quarantine um, reform for his entire professional career. Um, but, you know, he said in the end, uh, and this was in like October of 2020, November 2020, um, he just completely underestimated uh, the, the politics of it all. Um, the fact that even the politicians who are supposedly elected to protect the people who they represent um, just simply aren't put, aren't taking the the threat seriously, and are in fact, if anything, they're mocking it or um, you know helping spread the misinformation. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a multi pronged and, and and dangerous thing, and I think that the fact that it's often viral content online, you know, is just a nice uh, you know metaphoric slip, you know, that it, that it is it is in fact is uh, arguably as dangerous as the disease, disease itself. Indeed. Well, I mean. Fascinating conversation and uh, important considerations as well. I mean, I, I think if there's one thing that's for sure, this has certainly simulated all kinds of new thoughts, you know, just on, on our predicament. And, and it's such a valuable perspective. And what never ceases to amaze me, and Mark might uh, you know, hate me for saying, is how so frequently these issues intersect with outer space as well. Now, I, I know um, at times, uh, you know, we do kind of veer into the world of, you know, just the, the great beyond and all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, um, it's just remarkable that we just jumped from medieval Venice to interplanetary exploration within the span of 60 minutes. Jeff and Nikki, what an absolute pleasure it has been to have you on the program. And uh, and Mark, we, we do have some traditions on the program as well. And uh, <clears throat> I, I hand to you. Yeah, I wish it was. It's a viral meme, which I wish I hadn't started years ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, we've, we've been doing live events and we've been doing Uplink now for over a year. And at some point we decided that we should have a hand signal for Space Rocks. So it is the Vulcan salute, which I can't do today, the Vulcan salute. So that's space, live long and prosper and rocks. So Space Rocks. <laughs> so thank you and it's always good for social media so there you go being viral right to the end thank you very much both for coming on it's fantastic uh realize you have something else to go to i have a hundred thousand more questions and would love to meet with you at some point to discuss this um because it's it was always important to us of course in the space business as in any businesses to hear outside perspectives and to get the historical background because we even as scientists forget what has been learned before um, and it's this whole issue about protecting 
the universe from humans is something where I'm, you know, I hear the buzz and the change and younger generations coming along equally cautious and equally incautious. So I think it'd be great. I'm looking forward to reading your book and uh, it'd be lovely to meet up with you at some point and talk about this awesome more. Well, absolutely. Yeah, we absolutely love, love nothing yeah. more. And I think it is so interesting because the planetary protection um, ties so directly to the human experience, but they're rarely sort of discussed that together anymore. The, the, at the origin they were, and now, you know, um, it, it, they've seen as sort of different universes. <laughs> so oh, yeah. to speak. And, uh, and and they're really not. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank well, you. I, I mean, if it's nothing cool. else, we know that our astronauts on the ISS spend, they, you know, we, we send them up there to do science. They just spend most of the time cleaning the place so they don't die from all <laughs> the bugs which breed on the walls. And I will yeah. say just, you know, to prove that we're live, it's a slightly interesting time at the moment with the space station having gone somewhat out of control today as the uh, I, as the new um, module Norca docked with it, uh, the, the whole space station turned 45 degrees. So we're uh, kind of intrigued to see if that's been recovered. It has been recovered, but uh, space flight is not easy and we just don't need to add to it by doing crazy things like sending, as Emily Lackdewell, a famous uh, in, in uh, science communication, calls human beings filthy meat bags. Uh, don't send them to Mars without having figured it all out first. But... Uh, I'm kind of with her, but uh, let's see how it goes. The book is Until Proven Safe. Go to UntilProvenSafe.com for all good books, Shelley. Nikki and Jeff, what a pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Jeff. See you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Okay. Well, Mark, I got to say, um, you know, uh, fascinating people. And isn't it so interesting how frequently billionaires come up in the conversation <laughs> about space exploration as well? It's almost like we're having last week, I think. Yeah, I mean, the one the one thing I didn't get to mention, I mean, Nikki said, you know, that we'll come to a pragmatic solution to do with planetary protection, that we'll figure things out. But of course, there is the danger that we won't figure things out until it's too late. And in that, we've got the whole question of mega constellations, um, filling the sky with um, Wi-Fi routers to get yourself a faster internet on the ground. Well, while astronomers are trying to catch up and saying, well, hold on, we're going to see these things in our data all the time. So if you did send a rocket, uh, a spacecraft to Mars that hadn't been fully cleaned, you know, somebody had ignored the rules, um, legislation after the fact is too late. So it's important we have these discussions before we get to that point. Of course, we've sent spacecraft there before. And that quote from Jeff, um, um, uh, John Grunsfeld about, you know, there's already life on Mars because we sent it. Yeah, we've already we've already done it. So, uh, yeah, it's a super interesting topic. And uh, it's great to have uh, both Nikki and Jeff to tell us what they've learned from their research indeed indeed and uh, isn't it great that space rocks can intersect with so many different yeah. different areas of interest so mark as ever it's a pleasure um we'll be back uh next week Detail. we will yeah we will and, and let me just because you know for once we've got our act together um we're going to have a, a discussion next week about an event which is happening um in just over around a fortnight from now so we're going to we're going to preface it with a special uh, um, uh, uplink next week. We're going to be talking about the near simultaneous flybys of our Bepi Colombo spacecraft and our Solar Orbiter spacecraft. Solar Orbiter to study the Sun, Bepi Colombo to Mercury, but they're both flying past Venus um, within 36 hours of each other around the 9th and 10th of August. So we're going to have a couple of special guests on next week to tell us what we can learn from the flybys and again to update us on Bepi Colombo and Solar Orbiter. Uh, we've had guests on before to talk about the missions, but it's kind of a special moment as they're both going to be flying close above the cloud tops of Venus. Another planet that was thought to have life on it deep, you know, 100 years ago. We've since learned that it's way too hot to do that, but still a fascinating place. Is there life in the clouds, um, as some people have suggested in the last year? Let's talk to some people next week and find out what's going on. Indeed, it's going to be good. I look forward to it already, Mark. A pleasure to see you as always. And thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. We'll see you Th soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alex. See you soon.